Hello everyone, this is Spencer Snowling from Hydromantis and I'm glad that you're able to join us for uh, today's webinar on GPSX and today we're going to be talking about one of the essentially fundamental parts of doing uh, modeling of wastewater treatment systems which is the basics of how you calibrate your model so that it gives you uh, reasonable results so that you have some confidence in what the model is telling you. Uh, you often need to be able to, to go through that process of tuning some of the parameters so that they um, can reproduce some measurements that you've taken in the field. So um, it's often one of the most uh, time consuming and can be sometimes one of the most challenging steps in going through uh, any modeling project. So uh, uh, we've, we actually offer courses on calibration and so today I'm going to take a very very short, uh, our usual 20 to 25 minutes here in our webinars, uh, short discussion about the important parts of doing a steady state model uh, calibration. I realized when I was putting this uh, uh, webinar together that uh, it is, an, of course, a very deep field and um, I decided to stick to steady state today. Uh, we'll probably come back at some point in the future and do a dy dynamic model calibration as a separate web webinar. So, uh, my name is Spencer Snowling. I'm VP of Product Development here at Hydromantis. If I've not had the pleasure of meeting you before, so I'm glad that you can join us today. Our usual plan is that I'm going to show you some slides. I'm going to discuss a number of important topics. I will at some point flip over to my desktop and run some GPSX simulations where I'm going to sort of highlight the things that I've been talking about. In your GoToWebinar dashboard, you should find a questions panel, so feel free at any point along the way to enter in questions that you would like me to address. Uh, we usually collect all of those up and save them to uh, the very end of the webinar, and I will answer as many of those as possible when we get to the end. Okay, so the plan for today is to talk a little bit about model calibration. As I mentioned, we're going to stick to talking mostly about steady state today. Uh, talk about some of the calibration techniques and the things that are important to think about when you're putting that together. I'm going to talk a lot today about my experience with uh, calibrating models over my uh, coming up now on 19 years at Hydromantis. Um, and as part of that, we have, of course, developed a number of tools in our software that are there that uh, hopefully help make your calibration exercises go as smoothly and efficiently and quickly as possible. So I'll talk about those, highlight a few of those along the way. And then I put together a very straightforward, simple demonstration of uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about in the slides. And we'll do that uh, at the end. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, we can answer those as well. So moving on, uh, calibration, uh, when I'm talking about it for this webinar here, is talking really about the adjustment of the model input parameters so that you can improve the fit of the model uh, to some measured real data that you have. So uh, in any case, you're going to have uh, a solid line here on this graph that is the prediction of what the model says is going to happen. And then maybe you've got some data points that you've measured in the field that have some level of reality to them and probably some level of error included in there. And what you're going to do when you calibrate the model is to try and get the model to fit to that data as best uh, you possibly can. So here this isn't a terribly great fit in that image. Um, obviously we need to adjust some parameters in the model to push that line up into the spot where all of the data points are. So the calibration can focus on adjusting um, any number of physical parameters, operational parameters, biological parameters, uh, you know, settling and all of the other things that are part of the system. And I'm going to talk today about the very most common ones that you might run into adjusting. So the choice of the parameters that you might adjust is really dependent on your model, uh, what kind of uh, things that you have in your model, like if you have uh, biofilm or some other things that are a little bit more advanced, you might choose to do it a little differently. What the purpose of the modeling is, is a key issue and what available data that you have. Um, the reason I bring up the purpose of the model is that there, there are a lot of different levels of calibration. Um, it's very uh, common to do sort of, a, you know, a very quick and straightforward steady state calibration just to get things kind of in the ballpark. Uh, for the data that you have. You don't need to spend days and days on it. Um, but something that'll get you the, the sort of uh, plus or minus 20% kind of answers just to get a feeling for what's going on at a particular treatment plant. And then there's uh, you know other deeper levels of calibration where you're going to try and fit a large number of parameters to a very significant amount of data over a long period of time. Um, and that requires obviously more effort. And you would go about doing that in a different way. 
So the purpose of calibration is, as I mentioned before, to give you some confidence in, in the application of your model down the road. So the cali I like this slide because it kind of summarizes how this fits together. Um, the calibration is really, we're telling the model what we know to be true because we've measured it in the field. Um, then there's another step uh, where you would take the calibrated model and then test it and verify it versus another set of independent data, something that is similar but not the same set of data that you actually did the calibration with. So that verification is saying, can the model tell me something that I already know? Can it confirm that that calibration is good? And if that is true, then you move on to the application. I want the model now to tell me something I don't know. What is going to happen in the future if we take these three tanks out of service? and a really bad uh, wet weather event happens, that sort of thing. So we want to sit down, we want to be, do a calibration of our model, and there's obviously a number of steps involved. So the first step is to assess your data. And by assess the data, I mean take a really sort of uh, quantitative uh, look at the quality of that data and determine what parts of that data that you want to use for your calibration. Then you're going to plot that data alongside the, what the model is predicting and put there's lots of different me methods that I'm going to show you here shortly and how to do that. And then obviously adjust the appropriate parameters to move the model prediction closer to what those measured results are. And then that's the, sort of the big question, which parameters do I adjust and which direction uh, do I adjust them in? So um, that's what we're going to talk about uh, mostly today. So step one, assess your data. That first line, always check your data first. That is a key element, and we teach it in all of our modeling courses that we do at Hydromantis. And in fact, it is often a very significant amount of time. I've, I've been in GPSX training sessions with, uh, with clients over the years, and sometimes it's a little surprising when I say, okay, now we're gonna do the model calibration, and then we don't even touch GPSX for the first hour because we're not even looking at that yet. We're talking about what kind of data do you have? Is it uh, appropriate for doing a model calibration with? And so on. So um, the reason that we're doing that is because the model is based around mass balance. It's based around the mass balance of COD, of nitrogen, of phosphorus, and so on. So the model always is going to uh, mass balance when you look at the sum of all of the inputs and outputs that uh, happen in the system. So if your data doesn't mass balance because possibly the data has different meaning than what you had or maybe one particular point in your in your uh, treatment system has a uh, poor data points for some reason or another, um, if the data doesn't mass balance, then you'll never make the model fit to it. So you don't want to go chasing down some sort of condition and trying to get the model into a place where it can never go. So that's why it's always important to check your data first, make sure you're using appropriate data and, and, uh, and that it's good enough to be able to, uh, to do the job with uh, calibrating your model. So, and this is not to uh, run down anybody's data quality, that's just the nature of the data that we collect in this industry. So it's um, a challenging thing that we do wastewater treatment. So um, to be able to accurately get high quality data all the time is a, is a, is a very significant and important effort and uh, you know very expensive at times too. So, um, so what we're doing here when I have this discussion is just to try to talk about working with the data that, uh, that you have. So that typical data collection is going to be at several different points along the treatment train here. So I've just thrown up a, a, a typical train, just the activated sludge part from uh, GPSX layout that I had handy. Um, and what I would expect uh, when you're going to do a calibration exercise of just the activated sludge part here, I would expect to to want to get something in the neighborhood of flow temperature and pH, and then a number of concentrations for my influent. So COD, BOD, TSS and BSS, uh, TKN ammonia and phosphorus of some kind. You might have more, you might have less, uh, whatever it is, it varies from plant to plant depending on uh, that uh, particular plant's collection scheme. So. Um, what you're looking for in a lot of these cases is some sort of several months worth of data of typical operation. And that, that isn't to say that um, you can use any other kind of data, but you're looking for what we would call typical operation, you know, not when the plant was broken or many things were out of service or there was construction going on or what have you. So in this case, what you're looking for is something where I can take two or three months and say that this is a typical plant performance and I can use that data to um, summarize the steady state operation of that plant. I would also look to have some primary effluent and primary sludge information. Usually, most of the time, all I'll ever get for that is TSS and uh, some flow rates. 
Um, usually at the end of the activated sludge tank, we get a mixed liquor number. Almost always that will be available. Sometimes you can get MLVSS. That's really handy for doing good calibration of your model if you can get that number. And then a DO, that might just be at the end of the tank. Maybe you have it at several stages along the activated sludge tank. That would be better if you could get it. Um, and then some sort of a measurement of the amount of uh, sludge that's being recycled and being wasted from the system. And this is where I find probably the most variability across all the different kinds of projects that I do. Some plants have a fantastic handle on how much they're wasting and other plants don't. And, and, I, and it is for many complex reasons. Maybe their wasting schedule is not something that's continuous. Uh, you know, maybe just the physical configuration of the plant makes it difficult to be able to measure that exact thing at, uh, you know, at any given point in time. So, um, but you, often you may end up having to back out that number from other different kinds of information loading to the solids handling train or something like that. So that's, that's the kind of information you want. So you may have to dig around and, and uh, do something to be able to get your hands on that. And then of course you would normally get some effluent because that's usually some monitoring uh, um, data that's collected most of the time. Flow, COD, BOD, TSS, anything that is part of their permit um, is usually available. If they have other data on top of that, that's even better. Okay, so what do you do with this data? When we're assessing our data, we're going to try and make sure that it is reasonable. Uh, one of the very first things that we ever do is to check the influent data ratio. So this is more of a stoichiometry check than anything. So look at the VSS to TSS ratio, the BOD to COD ratio, MONI to TKN, and COD filter to total. Those are numbers that are not going to vary a great deal from plant to plant um, uh, over the long term. So these numbers that I often do on each individual data point and then on the averages as a whole will give us a feeling for whether something is greatly out of whack. And so these ranges that we've provided here, um, these are actually taken from um, uh, the uh, Good Modeling Practice Report from, from WEF. Uh, these numbers are very typical ranges for municipal wastewater. If for some reason that you have um, wastewater that is less biodegradable, if it has more inert material into it, if you, if you are working for a municipality that has received a lot of industrial wastewater, you may find that some of these are different. Um, if you're treating entirely wastewater, like if you work at a treatment plant where it's entirely industrial wastewater, then who knows, you know, all bets are off at that point. But, but uh, for regular municipal waste, these are, are, are pretty good numbers that you can use to test. You know, it might fall in and around these ranges. If it's wildly different, then, you, then there's probably some problem with your data. The second thing that we usually do is a little mass balance of solids through the secondary clarifier. This is very handy in order to be able to make sure that the mixed liquor and the sludge production and the other things that we're going to try to match later on are actually valid numbers and we're not sort of missing something along the way somewhere. Been to plants where a lot of the times we are trying to work with uh, say four trains in parallel or two trains in parallel and it's not really clear whether the numbers that we're working with for say sludge production or wastage are for one train or all the trains. So often doing this kind of thing will immediately point out whether uh, that's the case or not. So, so what we're plotting here is the cumulative mass um, out of the clarifier and the cumulative mass into the clarifier. So we take the, for, for this axis, we take the mixed liquor coming in, uh, we multiply it by the flow rate, so you get a mass coming in and then you accumulate that over time. So all these data points here are the accumulation over, I think this particular graph is showing 60 days or 90 days. This was from a plant here in Ontario, not too far from where we're from. And uh, of course, over the long period of time, over several months, the flow into the clarifier should roughly equal the flow out of the clarifier. And that should plot along this perfect 45 degree line, showing that the amount of flow coming in equals the amount of, sorry, not the amount of flow, the amount of solids coming in should equal the amount of solids going out. So here's some real data. We plot along for that first little while, it really did fit perfectly well. And something happened with one of the measurements and it deviated for a while, but you can see that systematically it's been pretty good. And so I would consider this to be actually a quite a good fit and I wouldn't have any questions at all about the data that I would be using. What you see sometimes is a line that is nice and straight, but at a different angle, like it might go up this way or it might be down here. Um, usually that's a very, 
um, systematic measurement issue. So either this is this is missing somehow some systematic uh, element, like maybe it is only for one train when actually you're trying to do this for two trains. And um, or maybe there is just purely a measurement error or the data has been collected in a way that's not clear to you. Um, and so this is a great methodology for figuring out when you have that kind of problem. Um, you could even use it to sort of correct for error, measurement error by figuring out what has to be corrected by how much in order to bring it back up to that 45 degree line. And thirdly, um, I must always check the sludge, pro like the sludge production ratio. So basically how much sludge are we producing per um, you, per amount of BOD being removed. So, and again, this is a good thing that is uh, a nice rough check and you got some ranges and it's pretty solid type of, of calculation that you can do, um, you know, for any municipal, regular municipal wastewater. So the top part here is basically uh, the solids coming um, uh, from the primary clarifier and then the solids that is being wasted. This is primary sludge, this is secondary sludge. We're adding that up, that's our total sludge production. And then this is BOD in and BOD out times the flow. So basically this is the total mass of BOD being removed. So how much sludge is produced per BOD removed? And that ratio should fall within sort of 0.7 to 1 uh, ratio of grams of TSS per gram of BOD removed. It's also the same ratio if you do it in, um, you know, pounds as well. So since it's a mass ratio, and so that is uh, very reliable. And I found, and it tends, I would say, for a lot of the projects that I've had in the recent past, a little closer to one than it is to 0.7. Um, the other thing is this is a little bit sensitive again to um, the biodegradability of the waste. So this is. 0.7 to 0.1 is fantastic for regular municipal wastewater. Um, I have, if you've attended our webinars before, uh, you've probably heard me talk about some of the industrial wastewater projects that I've worked on, and many of them are food processing related. So some of those had high inert fractions in them, and I've seen ratios that start to get above one. Uh, but generally, you can use that ratio as a good assessment for whether your data makes sense. So one of the things you're going to be trying to match is mixed liquor and sludge production in most of your calibration. So you want to make sure those numbers are decent and they make some sense. Okay, so we've figured out that we've got data that we like. We've got a period of time for typical results. All our ratios look good. Now we're moving on to, to doing the actual uh, calibration, which means we want to get the data into GPSX and plot alongside the simulation. So there's lots of different ways to do this in GPSX. You can set up a spreadsheet with uh, all the data that you have in columns uh, over time. You could, for a steady state, you'd basically just need one row that said steady state, use all these different da data for the uh, different variables that you're trying to match to. You can also cut and paste it directly into some of the data fields in GPSX or manually enter the steady state values into some of the graphs. So, um, uh, oh, and I always remember to try and set the temperature. That's one thing that I uh, tend to forget is it's always the one thing that you're trying to set up in your model that's different, located in a different place than everything else. Um, and then you would plot and run some simulations. Now, this is a dynamic one. I'm reusing that graph that I showed you earlier, but, but generally it's the same thing. You are taking a spreadsheet, you fill the columns with uh, data, and then that gets attached to your GPSX layout in the configuration menu, and then you can plot all of that data. This is essentially GPSX tutorial four. So I won't go into all of that detail and demonstrate it right now, but you can always look in our tutorial guide, which is available from the help menu, or you can come to our YouTube channel and uh, Hydromantis, uh, sorry, the, it's youtube.com slash Hydromantis, and you can find all of our tutorials there, and you can find out how to import that data. One of the things that I find is most useful for doing a steady state calibration is the digital graph. By digital, it means if you right click on the graph and you select the type that you want, that being a regular time series graph or a bar graph or the 3D bar graph, one of the options is digital. And it just prints out the number at the end of the simulation. This is the one that's the most useful for doing steady state modeling. And so, uh, so here we might find, say, some effluent numbers. Um, one of the things that's really helpful is that you can actually put the targets that you're trying to calibrate to into this column right here. And you do that by uh, right clicking and selecting the graph properties. This is where in the other models, or sorry, the other graph types, you would be setting things like axes and whatnot. Uh, but in this case, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you click on the file and then you click on data file and then you can enter in whatever values that you like. 
Um, also, just like in tutorial four, you could also import this from a spreadsheet if you like as well. And ultimately what you'll end up with is uh, for all the things you're trying to uh, uh, plot up here, you'll see the model results and you'll see the targets that you're shooting for uh, side by side. You can do the same thing for bar graphs. And this is a feature that um, we've had for a long time, but I've only really sort of gotten into using it a lot myself uh, lately as we've been involved in a number of um, nitrification and denitrification projects where I really wanted to see ammonia and nitrate nitrate uh, profiles along the length of the plug flow activated sludge tanks. And um, in this case, uh, if you read in some data, again, for steady state, or it works dynamically too, read in some data for each one of these um, bars from the spreadsheet, then what we do is we put these kind of like shadow things here. This is the shadow is actually the data point that's being read from your file. And then the solid bar is the actual model prediction. So this was a steady state solution. Uh, to some work that we did last year. And you can see here that uh, it's a nice way to sort of have the data point, but in that sort of bar graph format. And uh, it helps to be able to see that. And while you're working on your calibration, adjusting influent uh, uh, characteristics and so on. In this particular case, this was, we were really struggling with getting the denitrification sorted out. Uh, in which case I really had to keep an eye on this soluble COD number while adjusting this to try and fit this uh, nitrate and nitrate uh, profile. So uh, that was a handy way to do that. So as I mentioned, uh, don't forget the temperature when you're doing those sorts of things, uh, when you're putting this together, uh, just so that you know, I know this is sort of a random element thrown in here, that uh, this is the uh, site properties button at the very top. This is where we put all of the other parameters for your wastewater treatment plant that are not you know, tied down to a specific uh, object or a specific unit process. And in this case here, the liquid temperature is the very first thing on the first tab. So, and temperature plays a huge role uh, actually in the performance of your activated sludge plant and is uh, therefore really important to make sure you have that set properly when you do uh, your calibration. And if you go to our YouTube channel, YouTube channel, we actually gave a uh, YouTube, uh, sorry, a webinar on this a couple of years ago, uh, talking about how temperature influences all the different aspects of biological and physical elements of the models that we have. Okay, moving on now. So say you've got all that, you've got your data, it's good. You've got it into GPSX, you're plotting your simulations and now you're trying to adjust some parameters. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. The, in a lot of other modeling that's done out there in the world, outside of the, the wastewater world that we live in, um, there are formal statistical parameter estimation techniques that are available and they've been around for a long time and you just let this algorithm uh, have at your model and make adjustments and go on. And we actually have that tool built into GPSX. But for doing this type of calibration, it is pretty tough to make that work very reliably and very quickly, uh, mostly because um, there are so many different parameters that you could potentially adjust in the model. And these parameters are actually correlated. The ASM models are on the whole kind of over-parameterized a little bit. The reason is because they were developed with the wastewater engineer in mind. So all of the parameters have a, a meaning in the wastewater uh, world there. There's something that an engineer could look at. Oh, I see like a growth rate or a half saturation coefficient. I can understand how those go. But from a purely mathematical point of view, those things kind of are correlated and, and um, you can have two different sets of parameters that will give you the same results, which means that there's a few too many degrees of freedom. But nonetheless, uh, uh, those formal parameter estimation techniques are not the way that most people do it. What most people do is, based on your experience and your engineering judgment, adjust certain parameters that you know are okay to, suggest, uh, to adjust and also um, inspect the results visually. Am I getting closer to my uh, data points? Or am I getting farther away? And then go through a bit of an iterative process to get that done. Now, what we've learned over all these years is that calibration of activated sludge is mainly about setting up the influent property, uh, influent properly, um, and to a certain degree, uh, dealing with the settling parameters as well. It is not as common to actually adjust the biological parameters. I think back at the beginning, like 20 years ago in this industry, there was a bit more of a direct adjustment of, of uh, biological parameters. But these days, it's about characterizing the influent correctly. And what that means is partitioning the COD into the three state variables or four state variables that the model needs to know. The soluble substrate, the particulate slowly biodegradable mm -hmm. substrate, and also the influence, uh, pardon me, the inerts uh, uh, 
particulate material. And what that means is you're dividing up that COD. You, you just have a total COD number. That's what the measurement came back from the lab. But um, in this case, you're trying to um, <clears throat> divide that up into soluble and particulate and into biodegradable and non-biodegradable. That's what the model needs to understand. And by doing that, you'll see that it has a huge effect on what's going on in your, your model. It affects the, the amount of biodegradable COD affects the DO and the amount of the uh, ML, MLDSS that you're going to be growing in your reactor. And that soluble substrate is also important for, you know, bio P and denitrification and other things that are going on. So. Um, the data itself that you're using in your influent uh, might have more than one uh, possible uh, fractionation that will give you, you know, a reasonable calibration. It's, it's sort of a bit of a, a range kind of thing. And so, um, but, uh, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're a bit over parameterized, but you'll, you'll by th going through this experience, understand where the uh, suitable ranges are. You don't want to go too far away from the defaults that we have here in GPSX unless you have good reason. And uh, so therefore, it's important to understand the information that you're entering in into the model. So starting with the influent, I'm going to deal with influent, I'm going to deal with the settling parameters, and I'm going to deal with the biological parameters here, telling you which ones are good, which ones you should leave alone. Um, when you're dealing with the influent, as you know, we have a special different kind of menu in GPSX for entering influent information. It's called Influent Advisor, and it allows you to directly make adjustments uh, to the values that are here and see how that will affect the, the breakdown of the influent information that you have. So you're likely going to start with this information, which is a bunch of uh, concentrations. That's the data that is sort of known that you're going to have from uh, uh, you know, back from the lab kind of thing. But the important stuff to also set is down here. This is in the left-hand column of Influent Advisor. And in these cases, you're really uh, making adjustments to stuff that you don't have a direct measurement for, but have a, a huge impact on the model. So you're going to be adjusting these things like the particulate inert fraction, the readily biodegradable fraction. This is where you adjust these things up and down in order to calibrate your model and get it performing correctly. Now, in the biological part uh, of the model, in, in the actual, uh, you know, biomass rate coefficients and so on, um, these models that we use and that have, we have now developed up over a period of 20 years, um, Mantis II and Mantis III and even the older ones, um, they're well calibrated, particularly the ones that are our in-house hydromantis models. Uh, we've done a lot of work over many years to, to keep the calibrations up to date. Um, they're well calibrated, and they don't usually need much in the way of adjustment, especially things like yields and inert fractions and so on. Those are pretty well known, and they do not change over time or plant to plant. Um, things like uh, growth rates of certain very sensitive biomass types and half-saturation coefficients are, are a bit more variable from plant to plant, and those are the things that you may sometimes uh, want to touch up. So in this case, you can see here, if we right-click on any one of the uh, activated sludge tanks and select the kinetic menu, these are the types of parameters that I'm talking about, the ones in the kinetic menu, the growth rates that you would find. Here I'm showing AOBs and NOBs for, for doing nitrification, and we can see this growth rate here, for example, and this growth rate here, some half-saturation and inhibition terms. If you're going to adjust anything, it might be some of these ones uh, in, in that case. And lastly, uh, talking about the settling parameters, uh, the ones that are, are, are there, they're accessible from the settling menu. And typically, I work with our settling uh, SVI correlation turned on so that I can deal with these two parameters here, the SVI and the clarification parameter. And I'm going to show you that a little bit more down the road um, in our uh, uh, demonstration I'll do for my desktop here shortly. So the next three slides are basically going to show you this, the, the stuff that's the most thing, important thing to know. So the typical influent parameters that you would adjust in your influent are the influent ratios, VSS to TSS, and the uh, nutrient fractions, for example. And the most important one of all of them is the FRXI, the particulate inert fraction of total COD. And in that case, really, it's talking about how much of this total COD that's coming into my plant is particulate inert, is, is something that is not going to biodegrade, but is going to get collected up and accumulated in my mixed liquor. So if I increase that fraction in the influent, it will increase my mixed liquor accordingly. And this is an effect that is 
uh, to a large degree, m more noticeable than plants that have longer SRT. So, uh, so you'll you'll note that. So settling as far as settling parameters go, I tend to use the SVI correlation that I mentioned earlier and that clarification parameter. And one other parameter, which is really important, which is the feed point from the bottom of the clarifier. That meaning, where do those solids come in? What, what height do the solids come in at? And that's actually on the physical menu, not on the settling menu. And basically, um, even though you may in reality uh, have, you know, whatever aperture or opening brings the solids into your clarifier, and you may have some baffling or uh, energy reduction uh, there in your center well or whatever. Um, don't put the actual settle, setting in the model at the very top of the clarifier. Um, the reason is that we have a one-dimensional clarifier model, so you'll find that you have very high solids in your effluent. Uh, really, what you should do is put it at the um, at the value where it's sort of close to where the sludge blanket height would be, because really that's where the solids are falling to, and then it'll it'll go from there. So you may find that adjusting the feed point is one of those things that um, you would think you have a solid measurement for it. It's not something that's a you know really something you should change, but actually the feed point is a calibration parameter. So lastly, now we're on to the biological ones, and really you only adjust these if you if all of those other adjustments have not really got the, the, the calibration completed. And then you'll find that um, the autotrophic growth rates and half saturation and inhibition coefficients, that sort of thing is the stuff that you may want to make adjustments to um, in your model. So this is from that uh, kinetic menu. The, the autotrophs tend to be sensitive to you know, certain things in the influent, uh, po possibly toxic or in inhibitory things if you have municipal wastewater. So whereas heterotrophs are really robust and kind of have the same uh, growth rate no matter where I go, the autotrophs too tend to be up and down depending on what's going on in that particular plant. So what are the most important parameters? Well, all of them, but it really depends on the situation. If, you're, if your modeling is all about uh, nitrification, then you should really be looking at making sure you can tune those things as best you can. Now, as I mentioned, we don't want to make a lot of changes to these biological parameters because we feel that they're pretty good defaults. Uh, they're good for municipal wastewater, but there is sens sensitivity to temperature. As I mentioned, make sure you've got your temperature set. And those sensitivity uh, parameters, the ones that are telling us how sensitive uh, the model is to any particular, like each one of the parameters is to the temperature, that's found at the very bottom of the uh, kinetic menu, and you can adjust those sometimes as well. And lastly, there are a lot of other parameters that will be part of your calibration as well. Those three sets that I've mentioned so far, the influent, the biological, and the settling, are the ones that you almost always have to make at least some adjustment to. Uh, there's also the uh, aeration parameters, you know, oxygen transfer efficiency and alpha and so on. Um, anything in your solids handling side, uh, the biofilm parameters, you may have to calibrate the surface area depending on how your media is configured or the maximum bio, maximum biofilm thickness. Um, digester gash production, that's usually pretty decent if you've, if you've got your influent characterized properly, then the sludge will also be characterized properly, but I've had some times too where we've had to uh, make adjustments to the model to match uh, digester gas production. And any other biomass types, if you, you may want to adjust uh, growth rates of Animox or what have you, if you've got good data on that. And lastly, all the other stuff that comes at the end of the plant, chlorination, filtration, chemical dosage sometimes needs a bit of calibration using those half saturation coefficients that are available in that particular model. Okay, so um, I wanted to do a live uh, calibration example. Um, I'm going to do an exceedingly simple one because uh, really normally we spend sort of half a day on doing calibration. So, um, but I'm going to start with this one. This is um, just the activated sludge part of the plant. So this is the primary effluent coming into a plug flow tank and uh, onto a secondary clarifier with a recycle and out into, uh, into the effluent. So, uh, oops, I forgot one slide I wanted to show you here. This one. So basically, we're just going to try and calibrate this little part here um, by uh, making some typical adjustments. And I want to match my mixed liquor to 2850 milligrams per liter. And I want to get my effluent solids and my effluent TKN um, in line to, to those numbers there 10 milligrams per liter for solids and four for TKN. Uh, so let's see what happens when we want to do that. 
So when I run my simulation here, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, when you set up a model like this, you've got all of these tabs that represent all of the different outputs from the model. So I can click on the aeration tab and it shows me the plug flow tank and I can see uh, very, the very top here is mixed liquor. So I can see my mixed liquor is actually about 3,100 or 30, uh, 3,090. Mm, you know, that's higher than what we actually want in this particular case. And some of the other numbers I want will be kind of scattered around. So what I often do is put them on uh, a tab by themselves using this digital graph. And we can see those three numbers there that I'm trying to uh, that I'm trying to meet too. So, so I can run this simulation. I think this number is too big. This one's too big. This one's too small. So we want to have uh, nice and at hand some of that data. I mentioned being able to import that uh, directly into this panel right here, and that is done. Uh, actually, I prepared ahead of time a little spreadsheet that contains uh, the numbers that I'm trying to match to. So I showed you earlier uh, time in the first axis and the long lists of data points for a bunch of different variables. In this case, we're only doing steady state. You can actually put STD in the time column here, the targets that you're shooting for, and that number will be imported in. Now, all we have to do is just tell GPSX to look at that data file, and that's done through this configuration menu here. And so we can use different data files for different scenarios. I'm just using the default one. So let's add that spreadsheet. So that is now done. And I'll run this one more time. And now we'll see, here's the numbers that I'm trying to match to. So right now, right off the bat, our MLSS is, is too high. It's at 3,100. We want to be at 2,850. Our solids in the effluent are a little bit high and our ammonia is a little, or pardon me, our TKN is a little bit too low. So I can start making adjustments. So um, as I mentioned before, we can adjust things that are in the influent. I put a bunch of uh, influent parameters up here. But as I mentioned, that particulate inert COD fraction is the most important thing to deal with. And there it is right there. Uh, particulate inert fraction of COD. It's right now at 13%. So that tells me that 13% of all that COD coming in is particulate inert material. By contrast, the readily biodegradable fraction is 20%. So since this number is too big, that means we want to make it less, pardon me, we want to make it more biodegradable. I want to decrease my inert fraction. I want to bring this number down. And so by doing that here, I'm going to um, uh, drop this number down to um, just 6%. And so, but basically, uh, we're going to kind of cut that number in half. So I took basically 7% of the COD off, and I'm going to actually add it to the readily biodegradable. So we'll put that at, uh, whoops, uh, we'll take that up from 20% to 27%. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking some of the total COD number, and I'm saying uh, we're not going to put quite as much in the inert part. We're going to put more of it into readily biodegradable. And then when I run my simulation again, we can see here that uh, essentially when, when we're running this, we're going to see an update right away. We're going to see here that this is now uh, 2936. So that's getting down closer to where we want to go. So I can, even, I can even chop another little bit off that. So let's put down, uh, let's put this at 28. So just a little bit more. Now, as I mentioned earlier before, it's important to try and, you know, not overdo it when you're when you're dialing in these numbers. It's important to keep in mind the variability of the data. So we're now at 2800. It's 2850 was the number we were shooting for. That's close enough. Uh, that's now within, you know, well under 5%. For our number of 2000 to try to get it inside 50, uh, you know, we are now saying it's very close. If you imagine all of the numbers that were used to calculate that 2850 average, they am sure were bouncing all over the place. So, um, so that's considered to be, I think, a pretty good fit. Okay, so on to the total suspended solids in the effluent. So our number is 12. We want to have 10. So we're going to make an adjustment to the settling. I mentioned before that adjusting the SVI and the clarification parameters were the ones that are sort of key for calibrating your model. Um, we, again, uh, have a whole different webinar on how to calibrate settling models. And so I'll refer you over to that one. In that webinar, we talk about how you use the clarification parameter. It's an empirical parameter that we've created that feeds information onto our regular uh, uh, Veselin settling model uh, parameters. 
Um, right now, it's an empirical it ranges between zero and one. It's set at 0.5, so that means that our, our we have sort of middle of the road settling, and we want to actually improve our settling so we can bring that solids number down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to 0.6. Just move it up a little bit. Um, even though this is zero to one, I don't recommend setting it uh, lower than 0.2 or higher than 0.8. Usually, uh, that's sort of a good valid range in between. Okay, so let's run that again, and we can see now we got it down around 10. Well, actually, we're almost right on 10. That's pretty good. You'll notice this number came up a little bit because now we're holding back just a little bit more solids in our system. And now it's on to calibrating the, the biological parameters to try and get that nitrification. Actually, we got to back it off a little bit in this particular case. So I'm going to go to the biological. I threw some parameters up here. And uh, so really what we're telling the system is that we want to dial this back so that we have four milligrams per liter in the effluent instead of three. So I'm going to push this back. So we're going to decrease this. I'm going to go to 0.75. I'm also going to decrease this one here as well. Oops, Hang on. I didn't type that right. There we go. And let's run that again. And uh, so that brought it up to 3.7. That's pretty good. Again, uh, I wouldn't try to dial it in too much closer than that because there's probably plus or minus at least 0.2 uh, or three on, on this uh, value of four that we're shooting for. So, you know, you could make further changes. These half saturation coefficients for, for the nitrifiers, you know, this is a measurement of the sensitivity of the nitrifiers to a lack of oxygen. Right now you have to get all the way down to 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.25 milligrams per liter in order for it to be severely impacted. You could make it more sensitive to oxygen by increasing this number. Although I don't do this unless I really have to because this is a very sensitive parameter. I'm just going to push it up a little bit and show you the effect. I mean, it went from 0.3 to, or sorry, three and a half to four point six, just by making that small change here. So um, it is sensitive when you're in that sort of, uh, you know, just hanging on to your nitrification range there. So, but nonetheless, adjusting those uh, biological growth rates, you know, had the desired effect. So now we've kind of calibrated it in, in a very simple way to, to what we would do. So that's sort of a, a simple version of what a, a calibration would be like in the steps that you would go through um, in, in those cases. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's totally dependent on what you're trying to do and what your plant is like, but uh, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that we would do during a, a steady state calibration. So I'm going to wind up the webinar here by talking about good modeling practices. So um, there are lots of things that we've learned over time by doing a lot of projects, and we sort of summarize these into three or four points that we tell uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, and it may seem extremely obvious to say this, but only change one thing at a time while you're doing your, your calibration, right? So calibration is an iterative process. You often make some changes, and then you move on to the next step. You make some more changes that may have affected the first thing that you were trying to dial in. Um, it depends. Uh, so, it, But don't try to deal two things at the same time. So uh, very many of these parameter changes can offset each other. If you were adjusting both the growth rate and that uh, oxygen half side at the same time, you could completely offset uh, that and sometimes cause things to be a little bit counterintuitive. So we always suggest try to do it in a systematic kind of way. Only change one thing at a time and remember where you were before before you started making the change. And as a matter of fact, we have features built into GPSX to help with that. Whenever you're making changes, you may have noticed this reset button comes alive when you've changed away from the default value. And at any point, you can click on that to go back to where you were. Another thing that I highly recommend is to document all of the changes that you make to uh, your parameters. Normally, you would probably want to include that in your modeling reports anyway. So it's always good to justify the changes that you're making to the default values and put that in your modeling report, uh, You know what the default value is, what your new calibrated value is, and the reason for the change. So you might say we adjusted the growth rate to match our effluent uh, ammonia. And again, we have features built into GPSX to help with that. Right next to every parameter that you find in GPSX is this little notes field on the left. If you click on it, um, you can enter in some details here. I trusted the, trusted the oxygen inhibition coefficient for denitrification, and I did that because I was adjusting to a match to the nitrate. So when you see these little lines on the paper, it means that somebody entered a note there, and you can just hold your cursor over it to find that. So last uh, last two points, keeping variability of data in mind, as I've mentioned several times. 
uh, you know, you're working with an average value. Often, actually, it's an average of an average. You may have a flow that's daily averages already, and then you take a whole month of those daily averages. So it's uh, try to remember the fact that there's a lot of variability in that. And also question and think about how or where that data was uh, collected. And lastly, some of the physical data that you're going to be using in your model is probably not uh, as advertised as, as we like to say. So, it, you know, there's often a lot of um, short circuiting, which means your volumes are not really as big as what, the, you know, the drawings might say. Um, imperfect mixing and so other things that are happening that might make you want to use or change a parameter in your model to make things look a little more realistic, even though you would theoretically have a measurement, a precise hard number for that. Uh, but you have to be willing to sort of question those volumes and, and in particular flow splits or something that's tripped us up uh, a few times over the years too when, when uh, to all intents and purposes everybody had every reason to believe that that was a 50-50 flow split but in, in reality it wasn't. Uh, some of the solids, more solids were going to one side of the plant than the other, uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, sometimes you have to calibrate those parameters uh, or make changes to those as part of your calibration. And uh, yeah, not too long ago, we had a project where we uh, had to reduce the size of the digester in order to match the gas production. Um, and the client was totally fine with that. They felt that the digester was probably short circuiting and probably had a little bit of inert material accumulated in it. So it probably wasn't really as big as it actually said it was. So uh, those are things that you may have to deal with. So. Final thoughts, uh, it's an iterative process. It's specific to each plant that you work on. Every project is different. Um, experience shows that the influent characterization is the most important thing and try to remember that variability uh, of your data.